Hello everyone and this is UMG TV. Welcome to the Lawyer's Desk. With me is Sir Muneeb Qadir, an advocate of the High Court and an LLM graduate of Intellectual Properties of Queen Mary University in London and has a prominent stand in educational and media platforms. Thank you so much sir for joining us Thanks. and today we are going to uh, find out more about deform uh, defamation laws and take an insight uh, with our guests. So sir, uh, tell me, what is the legal meaning of defamation law? Uh, no, defamation law, uh, you know, as far as the word defamation is concerned, you will not find any statutory definition, you know. In Pakistan, this area of law is uh, governed by the Defamation Ordinance 2002. Yeah. And in other jurisdictions, for example, the United Kingdom, there is now a, a new Act, Defamation Act 2013. Yeah. But interestingly, in most of these jurisdictions, you will not find a statutory meaning of defamatory or defamation. And for that, you have to look at common law, by which I mean you know, judge-made law, uh, case case law. According to case law, a defamation has been defined as, you know, a statement in any form, whether in writing or even a spoken word, which opens the plaintiff to hatred, contempt or ridicule, or which lowers the plaintiff in the estimation of uh, right-thinking members of society. So something which is likely to, you know, cause the plaintiff to be shunned by the right-thinking members of society is what is regarded as a defamatory material. So, for instance, if I were to say something about you, which to a reasonable person, you know, would lower your estimation in, you know, your, your reputation in the estimation, that is something which is defamatory. Okay. Something against which you have to protect yourself, or something against which we all want to protect ourselves. So, defamation law is concerned with the reputation of the plaintiff. Okay, so sir, how do we balance constitutional rights of freedom of expression with the law of defamation? That's a very pertinent question to which even the law has not been able to find a satisfactory answer because you see, to me, it's my freedom of expression yeah. to give an opinion about someone. Exactly. You know, and to another person, it might be really hurtful. You know, it might open them up to or subject them to, like I said, contempt, hatred or ridicule. Or it might lead them to be lowered in the estimation of right-thinking members of society. So how to balance these two? Uh, you know, the balance comes in from the range of defences which are available under the Defamation Ordinance 2002 to which the defendant might, uh, you know, uh, find recourse to. Because ultimately, even if you look at uh, Article 19 of the Constitution, which provides a right, a general right to freedom of expression, that general right is not absolute. So, I mean, inroads can be made to freedom of expression rights. It's not like, you know, I can say about anything, tarnishing anyone's reputation, and then I can, you know, try to protect myself behind the shield of freedom of expression. This is not how it works. We have to exercise our freedom of expression in a responsible and a proportionate manner. By proportionate, I mean something which, yes, allows me my freedoms, but also at the same time does not hinder someone else from exercising their freedom. So this is a difficult balance to strike indeed. And, you know, this could be improved if the law were to enumerate examples of what is acceptable speech and what is non-acceptable speech bordering on to defamation. Uh, until and unless that happens, we have to make do with the current situation. Okay, so what are the remedies available to plaintiff in a defamation suit? You know, the plaintiff would uh, preferably be looking for an injunction okay. if the defamatory statement is contained in a written material. So, for instance, if you know that, you know, I own a print media company and I'm going to publish an article about you in my next edition, which you are not very happy about, and because you feel that whatever that article contains is defamatory about you of within course. the meaning of defamatory under defamation law you would want to restrict me from publishing it basically you would not want anyone else to have access to of that course, material yeah. you would not want it to be released to the general public and so if you could prevent that that would be what you would uh, what you would be preferring the most so for that you could seek a prohibitory injunction prohibiting me from publishing the offending material but for example if it's too late if i've already published something and that is how it is in most of the cases usually you know the claim arises the plaintiff brings up the case about once the defamatory material is out there in the public domain. And that is a very essential uh, criterion for an actionable defamation suit. That defamatory material needs to have been published to others. Although, you know, it, the publication need not be very wide. You know, any publication would suffice. A publication to just more than one person would be enough to amount to publication for these purposes. But, of course, you know, the wider that the publication is, the more damaging it is uh, potentially to the 
reputation of the plaintiff. Yeah. So in that instance, if the publication has already happened, yes, you know, injunction would still help you in the sense that you would want to restrict further publication. So you would like to seek injunction against further publication of the same material. Other than that, of course, you would like to seek damages, compensation in monetary terms for the injury that has been done to your reputation. And also an offer of amends coming in from the uh, defendant, as well as an apology. So, for instance, if it's a magazine or a newspaper or even a television broadcast, which has been used as a platform where you've been defamed, you would like an apology to be issued on the same platform. You know, so there is a range of remedies which can be tailor-made to suit the exigencies of the particular plaintiff's claim. Okay, and uh, were the defense available to, defend, to the defendant of the defa uh, defamation um, suit? So mirroring uh, the plaintiff's wide range and variety of tailor-made yeah. remedies, there are also a wide range of defenses available to the defendant. You know, uh, one very contentious and usually contested defense is one of truth or justification. Now, this is a very interesting defense because truth is the defendant basically claiming okay. that what he said was true. And so, as a member of a free country, he should be allowed to state the truth. But it's not a very easy burden to discharge. It's not a very easy defense to avail. Because when a defendant is saying that what he had said about the plaintiff was essentially true, he has to prove the truth of his statements. Now, not the truth of every nitty-gritty statement that he made yeah. but overall you know he has to prove that his statement was substantially true although even if you know some parts of it might be exaggerated he has to prove that it was substantially true uh in the uk there's a very interesting case you know which okay. comes to mind where one of where, where the defendant uh, was a professor okay. she was a history professor and she had claimed that the plaintiff was not a historian he only claimed to be an historian he was General, you know, the allegation was that the plaintiff was on purpose trying to misinform his readers. Mm. Uh, she called the, plain, the plaintiff a Holocaust denier, an anti-Semite. And so the plaintiff in his, I mean, the plaintiff in his suit claimed that this was defamatory, that he was a genuine historian. He did not deliberately misinform his readers. And uh, the plaintiff said that it was on the basis of facts available to him that he had said that Holocaust had not really happened to the extent that it has been documented. So now it was upon the defendant to prove that Holocaust had indeed happened, on the basis of which oh. the plaintiff's statements were untrue. So she had to put history on trial. This was a case where Penguin Books and the author had to, in their defense, prove that Holocaust had indeed happened, in light of which they could then prove that this statement against the plaintiff that he was deliberately trying to misinform the public was true. Eventually this succeeded. But this was a case of its own kind, you know, where whole history and historical events were put on trial well, in defamation suit. Oh, wow. You know, so it can get very interesting. So truth is one defense, but there are other defenses available to the defendant as well. Uh, for instance, uh, affirmation. I mean, this is this springs where the plaintiff himself had affirmed and had agreed upon the publication, which he now claims to be defamatory. So, if the defendant's defense could prove that he had obtained the assent or consent of the plaintiff, uh, again, you know, that amounts to defense. Then there is the defense of absolute privilege, which is again a stone feature of any democratic society, which means that any reports of parliamentary proceedings. Any reports of judicial proceedings whereby you're reporting what a judge said, you know, or during a judicial pronouncement or what was said in parliament because parliamentary statements uh, have what are known as parliamentary privilege. Any report of the same cannot be the subject of a defamation suit. Then there is qualified privilege, which the media can use a lot to their advantage, uh, which requires them to prove that they had a duty to disseminate information to the receivers, basically the audience, to the receivers of the statement, the receivers of the statement, the audience had an interest in the media's context of public interest in receiving that information and that information was disseminated without any malice and with honesty. So if the media particularly could prove that it was a matter of public interest, they felt it their moral duty even, you know, the duty can come in various forms, legal duty or moral duty, yeah. they felt it their moral duty to inform the public as the watchdog of the society, and they had done so with, uh, without any malice or without uh, any dishonesty, then that operates as a defense. And then there's a defense, again, which can be used uh, very advantageously, advantageously by the media, but also by general members of the public. Uh, it's known as fair comment. And fair comment, 
you know, as the name suggests, means that as members of democratic society, we have a right to make a comment on matters of public interest. So if there's a matter of public interest on which we are making a statement of opinion based on facts, enlarging the public domain without any merits, then again we have a defence. And recently again, this kind of a defence, you know, has become very relevant in a very hyped up case, of which I think every single person in our country knows, the Aliza uh, Misha Shafi yeah. case. You know, because this case has arisen in the wave of the Me Too movement, which is a very useful movement, which was long awaited and which was long to and finally it is here. So, you know, in Pakistan, the first major case or the first major uh, event to have come to the limelight is one of one major pop star, Nisha Shafi, yeah. commenting on Twitter that she felt or she believes that she had been harassed. And then, you know, there was a retort from the other side. Yeah. Ariza first said that this, you know, damaged his reputation. He filed a defamation suit seeking a huge amount of damages against her. And since then, this whole legal battle has been going on, not only in the courts, but also on, you know, television shows, exactly. in the print media, on social, social media, media, people taking some very hard stance on their own versions of events and which also highlights that you know legal uh, means are not the only means to form an opinion or even to reach a conclusion a lot of people have already made up the conclusion exactly. on social media you know and naming and shaming the supporters of both these parties and even naming and shaming uh, both these people online you know leading to a lot of trolling as well uh, so that is another defense public interest now how could that defense aid Misha Shafi in the defamation suit, for instance. Uh, this is how it works, you know. The person who is accused that she has been harassed could add another dimension. She could cite the justification or the truth defense that what she's saying is true, for which she will have to prove that what she said was true and that is in process right now. But another defense that she could rely on, or any victim of harassment, a male or female or anyone who yeah. has been a victim of harassment or any kind of, you know, victim, could say, that it is in public interest that I am trying to shed light on a very public, uh, uh, publicly important matter. Harassment is a very serious matter in which the public has an interest. Victims need to know, victims need to have a voice, they need to know that they need to voice their victimization. They have to let everyone know and not let the offender just go freely. So, you know, that is another defense that a potential harassment victim could rely on if they were to find themselves being the defendant in a defamation suit. That what I said might be defamatory about someone else, but it was in the public interest on which I made a fair comment. So that is another defense for you. So again, you know, there's a plethora of defenses yeah. available to the defendant, which somehow leads to this area of law, defamation law being a level playing field between both the plaintiff and the defendant, the if the plaintiff has a lot of remedies, then to offset that, the defendant also has a plethora of defenses. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving much. us an introduction and also providing your knowledge of defamation law. Thank you so much, for, uh, sir, Thank for joining you. us. Thank we'll see you next time on another episode of uh, The Lawyer's Tech with, the, with more episodes concerning law. If you, need, if you want to see more episodes concerning law, go visit our website of UMT Official TV. My name is Madhur Khan and this is The Lawyer's Desk.